Hi everyone, my name is Angela Boldini, I'm a cognitive scientist and in this final video I give you a brief introduction about what we call long-term memory. Long-term memory is the type of memory that we are actually thinking about when we generally talk about memory. When someone complains and says, oh I'm not good at studying because I have no memory, what he or she is actually saying is, I sometimes struggle to retrieve information from my long-term memory, and that's why I think I'm not good at studying. Most of the times that doesn't obviously depend on their memory abilities or capacity, but that's another story. As you might already know, there are different types of long-term memory. Here you see a first basic uh, schema and ca categorization of the two main types of long-term memory, explicit memory and implicit memory. And the discriminating factor between the two is the presence or absence of conscious awareness of information retrieval. We talk about explicit or declarative memory when the person is aware that he or she is retrieving information from memory. We talk, on the other hand, about implicit or non-declarative memory when the person is not aware that he or she is retrieving information from memory. Explicit memory is further divided into episodic and semantic memory. Episodic memory is memory for events regarding our personal life or events that happen in the world in general. The main feature of episodic memory is that they are associated with specific details of time and space. For example, I remember that last year in May, there was a big scientific conference in London. Or I remember that last year in May, I went to a big scientific conference in London. These will be both examples of episodic memory. Semantic memory is memory for the things we know, the facts we are aware of. It's sometimes, it's sometimes presented as our mental encyclopedia. For example, knowing that Berlin is the capital of Germany is semantic memory, but remembering a visit to Berlin or remembering being told that Berlin is the capital of Germany is an example of episodic memory. In the educational context, of course, we have plenty of explicit memory tasks. We have, for example, what we technically call free recall tasks, like tell me everything you remember about such and such topic or tell me everything you remember about what we said in the last lesson. Or we can have what we call cue recall tasks, like tell me what's the relation between attention and short-term memory. In this question, I'm already suggesting that there is a relation between attention and short-term memory. So I'm giving a hint, a cue, as we call it, that helps information search in memory. And then, of course, we have the recognition tasks. Typical examples are the multiple choice tests, where one just has to recognize the correct answer, but doesn't need to make the effort to generate an answer, retrieving and elaborating information from scratch. These are the typical results that in the literature we get for these types of memory tests. The original data are from Alan Parkin, but these are really typical average data for these kind of memory tasks. Let's now move on to implicit or non-declarative memory. As I said earlier, we talk about implicit memory when there is no awareness of the fact that we are retrieving information from memory, when we have a sort of automatic recall. Let's have a look at what we mean with this. A first example of implicit memory is procedural memory. With procedural memory, we indicate memory mainly for motor skills, such as riding a bike, driving a car, or doing any automatic mechanic procedure that we have learned at some point in our life. So, for example, if I know how to drive a car, I get into the car, I start the engine, I put the car into gear, etc. But I don't do all these things thinking, oh, so what, what do I have to do now? Let me think. Let's see if I can remember where to start from here. We don't need to make a conscious effort to remember how to drive a car. It's simply something that we do automatically, of course. 
Why? Because these are all movements that we learn at some point in our life. And only back when we were learning all the procedures that we need to know to drive a car, we had to use explicit memory to remember and coordinate movements appropriately. But then, with experience, it all became automatic, something we do with no effort at all. Same applies to many other motor procedures we learn in our life. Let's just think, for example, about computers or mobile phones used, for example, or playing an instrument or any mechanical gesture we do in our daily job. I'm sure you got the idea here. Another example of implicit memory is the so-called priming effect. What do we mean with priming effect? We have a primary effect when we have a facilitated access to certain information due to previous encounter, conscious or not, of that very same information or a related concept, let's say. So for example, if I absent-mindedly see an orange or some oranges passing in front of a fruit and vegetable shop and five minutes later, a person asks me, tell me the first word beginning with O that you can think of. I might well say orange or oranges. Why? Because that concept is active in my mind. Even if I'm not aware of the fact that I just saw some oranges while passing by the shop. Of course, this effect is not automatic, it's not guarantee, I mean, but we can just say that in this example, other things being equal, the word orange would be chosen as a word starting with the letter O with higher probability than any other word. Here you have another example. Your task now is to complete these two words. If I had to bet, I'd say that you fill in the first word faster or more often correctly, considering a percent in a large group of people, of course, than the second, the second word. Why? Because we are talking about memory here. So you have that concept very active in your brain while the second word is more of a mystery, right? These are several different types of priming. There are, sorry, there are several different types of priming. Semantic priming, like pear and apple, associative priming, like pen and paper, perceptual priming, um, like uh, being, priming, being primed with an image to recognize another image, for example, etc. As you might have noticed, priming effect tasks or implicit memory tasks in general don't look like memory tests at all. They are more like quizzes, right? That, of course, is because if they were explicit memory tests, they would test explicit memory, not implicit memory. The third and final type of implicit memory that I mentioned here is the famous classical conditioning. I don't know, I, I don't think um, I need to explain too much here as this is the typical automatic, again, associator, association that for whatever reason we might create between a stimulus and a response. Stimulus and response that were not previously associated. Of course, the most famous example here is the experiment carried out by Pavlov with his dog, the dog that would start salivating as a response to a bell, even in the, in the absence of real food. I'm sure you all know this famous experiment. So we talk about long-term memory, explicit memory, implicit memory, but what happens when we learn things, especially in the education context? Well, in general, and as you might have already guessed, most of the concepts we learn at school will go, hopefully, from being episodic memories to be, being semantic or procedural memories. For example, if today I'm taught for the first time at school that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, this new learning would be an episodic memory for some time. I remember the lesson where, the lesson when I've learned 
that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, I remember what the teacher said, maybe the experiment we carried out in the lab, etc. But at some point, I will just know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. This information will be part of my semantic memory and, I, and it won't be associated to details of time and place anymore. I won't remember when and where I've learned this for the first time. I will just know that, waters, that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. With other types of learning, there's a switch from explicit to procedural memory. We saw the driving example earlier, but of course, and as I've already said, the same applies to all the automatic movements that we learn from using a computer to playing a musical instrument or operating with whatever technical instrument in a, in a scientific lab. Okay, so we talk about the different types of long-term memory here. And as usual, I now invite you to make a brief mental recap of everything we said so that you can start consolidate it, all the new information that your brain just registered. Take some notes if you want and if you need, and only once you have finished doing this, replay this video if you need to. Okay, so I leave it there. I finished and bye for now.